Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today with a look at how wheat varieties are developed here at Oklahoma State University. To begin, we need to imagine the wheat field as a classroom and the wheat itself as the students. Here's SUNUP intern Samantha Smith to explain. From first grade to 12th grade, potential wheat varieties move through class levels as they approach their release. So this is the 2014 sixth grade class. That means they have been in this program for six years now. They've been in the program in different states. Each one of these little rectangles or plots uh, represents a different line. The progeny of this line will breed true so that three, four years from now when they become 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, they could actually be commercialized and released as variety. Up until this point, we didn't have that kind of distinguishing characteristic. This is the middle of the program. It's also the centerpiece of the program because we have about 2,000, a little bit more than 2,000 students in this nursery that we want to take and figure out which ones have the best potential to make a variety, again, three or four years down the road. We do that through very careful selection for all those vegetative and reproductive characteristics. We want to get down to about 250 because that's about the number we can reasonably test through replicated trials across the state. The current sixth grade class is one evaluated for dual purpose wheat. So we're not actually measuring forage production, we're measuring those characteristics that contribute to forage production. So we look for canopy closure, but we also look for those things that provide good canopy closure. How fast it comes out of the ground, how healthy that seedling is when it comes out of the ground, the, the seedling vigor, and also the growth habit, just how, how um, erect or how prostrate that plant grows, and it's, it's a wide variation. At this stage in production, wheat won't look as good as it does here in the greenhouse. Carver took us out to the field to show us why every variety isn't necessarily suited for dual purpose production. So here we're looking at a, uh, in genetic terms, this is what we call a, an F6 line. So it's six generations beyond the cross that was made, uh, again, six years ago. Uh, this is a line that breeds true. Uh, we're looking at the forage characteristics uh, during this time of November. Here we're looking at the ability of, that, uh, of this line to close the canopy because the canopy closure usually means a good healthy canopy for grazing later on. We want to close that ground up to minimize moisture loss through evaporation. Of course, canopy closure also means a lot of forage produced. But some, some things that stand out for this plot that do not uh, really strike me as being extremely favorable, number one, it may not be very noticeable on camera, but to me, uh, looking at it, I see a very fine texture here. It's a very narrow leaf, um, and it also grows uh, somewhat prostrate. We didn't really get very good emergence. That, that there may be other reasons besides genetics that contributed to that, but we try to take that into account. So overall, I wouldn't rate this, this uh, particular plot as one that would be uh, favorable uh, for a grazing system. Now, that doesn't mean it wouldn't be uh, good for grain production. Well, here we're trying to take the best of both worlds. We want something that provides uh, a good, uh, uh, good grazeability uh, to the dual purpose producer, but also good grain production in the end. We guide and we structure our breeding program really about that dual purpose program. It, it, it puts a stress on the plant that we cannot get otherwise. We want to stress that plant so we can see how it tests under very harsh conditions that, you know, in Oklahoma we, we get our share of. Let's go look at another plot, maybe a more favorable one. Here's another progeny in the same uh, generation of inbreeding, so we're six years beyond the cross. I'm looking at uh, a more favorable canopy here. We're, we're not yet at canopy closure, but I see a very good growth habit. It's not extremely erect. It's not, certainly not prostrate. It's somewhere in the middle. And that's exactly what we're looking for. I'm also looking at very good and healthy tillers. Now this plot has yet to be, uh, we have yet to remove the forage. And we'll do that mechanically. We won't use cattle because I like to get out here and look at the, the, the uh, recovery of these plots after the forage have been removed and we can do a lot better job of controlling how much we remove using uh, basically lawnmowers. And we do that repeatedly throughout the fall season. I really like the way this looks in terms of its potential grazeability. I think it's going to have good persistent once the forage is removed. You want to see that vegetative recovery so you get more forage production. Remember this is a grass, so we want to select it as if it is a grass, at least for this time of the year. I, I would be very pleased to see how this, uh, this does in terms of grain production later on. 
Carver is the expert on this class and says the outcome looks promising. I, I know what the genetics are that go into it, and I know each and every year we're putting just a little bit better genetics into the program, so we hope to get something better out in the end. So every year is, is, is different. Every year I get more and more pumped about it. So uh, I, have, I have extreme confidence that this class is going to produce something in the next four years. And with Carver's work, that something will be good for both grazing and grain. For SUNUP, I'm Samantha Smith. Joining us once again is Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist. Kim, we've kind of settled into that time in the holidays when the markets sort of just take a breather. Let's talk about each of our commodities and what really to keep an eye on this time of year, and starting with wheat. Well, we can start with wheat, corn, or beans. I think all the commodities, two things are going to move prices during the month of December. That's going to be changes in fund positions and export sales. So we'll have to watch that. Watching the wheat market, uh, the Kansas City Board of Trade March contract is trading between $6.94 and $7.20. If it breaks that $6.94 on the way down, then we got another $0.30 cents below that. If it goes above $7.20, then the next target is $7.40. The basis is holding strong. That's good news, and I think it'll continue to do so. If you're watching that July contract, $6.85 to $7.10 the, the range right now. Above $7.10, then it goes to $7.27. Of course, breaks $6.85, then the $30 down. Wheat's in dormancy. It's in good shape. And so we're probably just not going to have much happen in the wheat market during the in, during the December time period, what really counts is after we get to January the 2nd. All right, now canola is getting more and more important here in the state. Let's talk about that market and what we're seeing there. Well, with canola, as you said, it, it's looking really good. The producers are rotating uh, the canola with wheat to clean up those wheat fields and get more wheat production. If, uh, the canola contract price for forward uh, contracting canola for uh, 14 uh, harvest, uh, it's about $9.40, somewhere in that range. Uh, six weeks ago, it was you know in the $9.75 range, so it's fallen off a little bit. Producers want to watch canola prices. They can watch that on the Winnipeg Exchange. Of course, it's in, in metric tons and Canadian dollars, and so like right now, it's around $5 and, uh, $505 a ton. They can divide that by 44.1 to get in, into bushels and then a basis of about $2. So if you've got the 505 divided by 44.1 and subtract $2, you've got about that $9.40 forward contract. All right, now let's talk corn. That's always a big crop. Uh, and it is a big crop, and it's pretty much in the bin. Uh, you read all the analysts, they say it's going to churn lower. I think corn has found the floor, and we've probably seen the bottom in the market right now. Uh, corn prices, if they, w I don't think they can work lower because corn's got to protect acres for that that 14 crop because soybean prices have been going up. Now you mentioned soybean prices. What's happening in that market? Well, there's good soybean demand. Of course, uh, soybean stocks are tighter than uh, than the corn uh, than corn stocks. The market's trading between thirteen dollars and thirteen forty. We bottomed out at twelve forty-seven, and we we went back up. You know, that, that spread between the soybeans and the corn is extremely important because as that spread gets wider, then producers are going to plant more soybeans. But the, the ethanol plants, they're already looking out to the 14, 15 year, and they want to keep these corn stocks up because they're making some profit at current corn prices, and they've got to maintain those corn acres. All right, good information as always. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet weather report. With the cold weather firmly entrenched across Oklahoma, we hope you, your family, and friends are safe and warm. How sharp of a change has this latest cold been for us? A map from Wednesday at 2.20 in the afternoon showed a huge range in air temperature across Oklahoma. In the southeast at Idabel, it was beach weather, 76 degrees. Going from the southeast to the northwest, temperatures quickly dropped into the 60s, then the 50s fell into the 40s, 30s, and in far northwest Kenton, it was a frigid 20 degrees. The winds at the same time were below five miles per hour and out of the south in the small blue area near Idabel. Traveling northwest across the state, winds switched to the north and increased in speed, whipping up to 19 miles per hour in the panhandle.
Those higher wind speeds combined with the cold air temperatures made Boise City and Canton feel like it was six degrees. You heard right, it felt like six degrees in Boise City. And way down in the southeast, it felt like 76 degrees. A 70 degree spread in wind chill across Oklahoma Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday evening saw a big range in cattle comfort. At 7.10 p.m., Idabel was at 60. Moving northwest, the cattle comfort index quickly fell into the 20s, then the teens. It was single digits in the panhandle, with Boise City cattle comfort at minus 2 and Canton minus 3. That was a 63 degree range in cattle comfort. While frozen precipitation can make it hazardous for us humans and livestock, it can be a real plus for soils and crops. Almost all of the moisture from melting snow, sleet, or freezing rain goes into the soil. Frozen precipitation that covers plants acts as insulation, protecting plants from bitter cold temperatures. With the extended cold, it will be a while before everything melts and all the mesonet soil moisture sensors are reporting again. Soil maps from December 3rd, just prior to our latest round of wet weather, showed high soil moisture levels across much of eastern and central Oklahoma. These are the dark green areas with values of 0.8 to 1 at the 10 inch depth. Western areas were more spotty with three distinct dry areas near Altus, Alva to Buffalo, and the Panhandle. Dropping down to the 24-inch depth, we see a lot more areas in the Panhandle and western Oklahoma that were short on deeper moisture. Those drier, deeper soils were a carryover of the drought conditions that started way back in 2010. The lack of deeper soil moisture in some western Oklahoma soils shows up as low plant available water amounts on a map from the surface down to 32 inches from December 3rd. While you enjoy all of December has to offer, we hope you and your family stay safe and warm. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. And Daryl, we wrapped up Thanksgiving. We're on fast forward toward Christmas. Let's kind of take a look at beef demand this time of year. You know, this fall, uh, prior to Thanksgiving, we saw beef uh, wholesale values, choice box beef, moved back above the $2 a pound mark. It dropped uh, just for a, a couple of days right before Thanksgiving, but actually during Thanksgiving week came back up over $2 a pound. And so it's holding up pretty well. And, and certainly here and in, in after Thanksgiving, there's some buying ahead, uh, you know, beef uh, prime rib and things have become very popular for New Year's. So beef demand is holding up pretty well here through this holiday period, even though we don't think of it as a strong beef demand time. Let's look at prices now. Some people kind of concerned that beef is going to price itself out for consumers. You know, with the expectations we have for reduced production next year, prices are going to continue to move higher. We're already at nearly record levels at these wholesale prices. So that is a concern. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, people adjust. Uh, the beef industry is very complex. The beef demand uh, situation is very complex. And so as we move to higher prices, we know there'll be adjustments. Uh, consumers will choose different beef products. Much of that uh, demand issue is, is a function of choosing between and moving between different beef products. Uh, so, you know, there's reason to be concerned and we certainly have to watch it as we move to probably record wholesale and retail prices next year. But at the same, same time, there's, there's uh, quite a bit of optimism that beef demand will hold up and, and support the, uh, the, the pressure in the market. Looking at competing meats, what's the situation there? And let's kind of look at pork first. You know, obviously, as we move beef to higher prices, to record price levels, those competing meats uh, will be important. Both pork and poultry are, are set to expand a bit. The pork industry has really been struggling, however, with a disease issue much of this year. They have not yet been able to get this under control. It's the PED virus, uh, and, and that's still affecting things, and it's beginning to show up now as moderating some of the increase in, beef, in pork production that was expected. So it will certainly reduce it somewhat, although it will still increase in the first part of next year. 
The other thing that's important from a beef perspective in terms of the competing meat issue is that much of that increase in pork production will likely get exported. So I don't think pork is going to add a lot to the beef industry challenge in 2014, at least not in the early part of the year. If they get the disease under control, maybe more so later in the year. And then how about poultry? How's that going to impact the livestock markets? You know, from a beef standpoint, poultry has been ramping up production much of 2013 and, and may be a bigger challenge for us. Uh, uh, the, the poultry industry was counting on lower feed prices on the one hand to help profitability, and they were also counting on these higher beef prices to help support poultry demand. And so you know, we, we know we're going to see those increases. We're looking at about a 4% increase in broiler production next year. We'll export some of that, but we're going to see a significant increase in poultry consumption probably in the U.S. next year. However, I would say that uh, in the last part of 2013 here, we've seen broiler wholesale values weaken somewhat, even in the face of high beef prices. And so that's, that reminds us once again that while these meats are substitutes, they're not perfect substitutes. They don't substitute on a pound for pound basis. And so that's gonna be, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing from a beef perspective in terms of, of how those competing meats will affect beef demand in 2014. And I think prime rib sounds pretty good for New Year's Eve. Sir, it's sounding good all the time, isn't it? Okay, Daryl Peel, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. In 2013, SunUp traveled to every corner of this great state to tell the story of amazing Oklahoma agricultural producers. Now we need your help to decide which stories are the favorites of 2013. Take a couple of seconds and visit the SunUp Facebook page to cast your vote. Then watch for your favorite SunUp story in the Best of 2013 show at the end of December. Vote for your favorite today at facebook.com forward slash SunUp TV. Educators often use the term, uh, this is a teachable moment. Well, this cold weather that's uh, suddenly hit the Southern Plains uh, serves as that teachable moment as, as I'm reminded of those situations that seem to occur year after year, the horror stories that come in when we have that first real cold wintry blast where producers will take out the good hay for the first time all fall or winter. By the good hay, I mean he's been feeding grass hay up until now, but because of the, the weather and the increased nutrient requirements that the weather causes on the cows, he decides to take out one of the forage sorghum hays that he's put up this summer. In most cases, it's safe and a good idea. But in a few instances, if we haven't tested that forage sorghum for the nitrate content, what we end up doing is causing a bigger problem. If we take out a high nitrate hay, such as we might have in some of those summer annuals that we've put up, especially in the, the more drought stressed areas of far western Oklahoma, then we have a situation that's really set up for disaster. The cows have gone through that winter storm. They're hungry and they're stressed. This good, very palatable hay is placed in front of them. They take on a huge uh, meal of that high nitrate hay and then of course the disaster occurs. Next morning we see several of them that have succumbed to the high nitrate laying very, very close to that hay bale. I think the, the remedy here is to first of all, if we haven't started using that high, uh, potentially high nitrate hay, let's test any of those summer annual hays and see what the nitrate content is. And that might give us a clue as to how we'd better feed it. In future years, I would suggest that we start to feed the forage, forage sorghum haze a little earlier in the fall in smaller amounts, making sure that the cows are, are adequately filled with something like grass hay or standing grass, and then gradually increase the amount of the forage sorghum that they're taking in, instead of them getting one big glut of a meal right during the snowstorm. I think if we'll just use a little common sense and prevent this situation, we can uh, save those horror stories from happening on our operation and certainly uh, save uh, uh, some very, very valuable and important cows in our herd. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Now to a story about finances and real life lessons for high schoolers about the future. We visited South Central Oklahoma for a dose of reality. 
Buses from three different counties arrive at the Mid-America Technology Center in Wayne. Inside, these high school freshmen put pencils to paper, calculating income, savings, and taxes as if they were 25 years old. How many of you at this point in your lives plan on going to college? They also ponder thought-provoking questions, like the importance of graduating and going to college. Cleveland County Extension Director Susan Moffitt helps organize the event. You know, not all of us learn by reading something in a book. And some of us really need to get our hands in it and really experience something before we realize that, oh, Budgeting means I have to look at how much money I have and make it last till the end of the month. And, you know, we see students that get some of that at home, but we also see students that have no clue the cost of a car or the cost of some place to live or how much it costs to buy groceries or raise a child. From here, it's a short walk down the hall to Reality Check 101, a marketplace that simulates real life with different stops along the way to pay for housing, insurance, child care, and transportation. And that's just the beginning. 14-year-old Connor Gantz is a freshman at Purcell High School. My career is a legal secretary and my yearly salary is $26,750. And then I'm single with uh, one kid and it's four-year-old. and. Um, my monthly family income is $2,209 um, and then I only bring home $1,690. Connor gets to work, carefully calculating how much he spent along the way. I'm fixing to go get a house so, and then I'm going to go get insurance for it. Nearly 1,000 students go through this reality check over three days. It's a program of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service carried out by dozens of volunteers. I, I'm amazed at the, the outpouring of support from our, our business and industry people in the communities. And they see it as valuable and I think that speaks volumes. Before long, students are beginning to understand what their parents go through each month. Well, I just didn't know about how much all the bills, I mean I've heard them say like the water bills this and the electric bills this. so. But when you put it all together, I never really thought about it like that. After the bills are paid, students end up here, where it's time to check out. And Connor finds out if he gets a payday candy bar or a zero. Good job, you get a payday. Just give it to them there. And a heavy dose of reality. Kids that age, they don't realize the cost of life and what it, what it really uh, is going to take for them to be successful. They all want a nice car, they all want to live in a nice place, and they all want a job that pays a whole lot right out of high school, you know, and, and uh, it's a little bit of an eye-opener for them and, and it kind of puts things in perspective. When it's all over, Susan Moffat asks another important question. What, if anything, did you learn from this? It's everything from I'm going to go home and thank my parents for what they do for me that I didn't realize or, you know, I'm going to finish school because I know I can make more money when I finish school or, uh, you know, I don't have to have the best of everything. I can, I can use secondhand furniture or I can buy my clothing at Goodwill or whatever at a thrift store. A reality check they will take with them on the bus ride home and hopefully for the rest of their lives. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about screwdrivers and getting to that hard to reach place. Okay, sometimes you may have a fastener that you can't actually get a straight screwdriver in because you're limited on space. So, you know, you can always go to a shorter screwdriver, but if you're even more limited than that, you're probably going to be looking at something that's already, that's got a 90 degree bend in it. And you can buy these from your hardware store uh, pre-made, but you can also make your own. Just uh, put these in a vise and heat them up and, and bend them. So yeah, just, uh, go ahead and, uh, and do that. A lot of times when you find out you need one, you kind of need it right now. And so uh, take an old screwdriver, bend it, and you're ready to go. Now one thing I do need to tell you before you bend these things, um, when you're doing this, you need to heat this up before you bend it because some of these are pretty brittle and they'll, they'll break off and need to be wearing safety glasses when you do that too as well because these things can be brittle so heat them up before you try to bend them. So there's a tip on screwdrivers in those hard to reach places. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop.
The Oklahoma Mesonet has towers across the state that read and report the conditions. And a similar concept is behind a project underway at an OSU research station in the southwest part of the state. The National Ecological Observatory Network, typically called NEON for short, constructed this tower at the Marvin Clemmy Range Research Station at Bessie. It's one of only two in Oklahoma, 60 across the country, that will take dozens of measurements related to weather, climate, and ecology. Every 10 seconds they'll be collecting information about everything that you'd like to know about the weather, the cloud cover, the incoming solar radiation, the temperature, the humidity, uh, variables in the soil like soil moisture, soil temperature. But they'll also be measuring in, uh, factors of the biological organisms. The, they, they picked out some key species. Just building the tower turned out to be a delicate process. So they don't want to change the nature of the location. They don't want to change the way it receives solar radiation. They don't want to change the way the, the precipitation. They don't want to change the way the organisms interact. Um, on the site, so they have to be very careful to have no impact or as little as possible on the site where these towers go in. Instruments on the tower will measure conditions for 30 years. How things are now and how it will evolve, you know, whether it's the environment, grasses, wildlife, whatever, whatever is here. Data collected from the tower at Bessie will be combined with information gathered from other sites across this region and across the United States, hopefully giving experts at the National Science Foundation a better picture of just how our environment is evolving. And that'll do it for us this week on SUNUP. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.